Well, good morning. Welcome to Renolda Church. If I haven't met you before, my name is Chris. I serve as our executive pastor. Our senior pastor, Alan Wright, is away this weekend. He'll be back in the pulpit with us next weekend. He sends you his best special welcome to those who are worshiping with us at our Union Cross campus, those who are worshiping in our Clemens launch team on the Village campus, getting ready to go out this fall to launch a new campus, and anyone who might be joining us online today. We're so glad that you're with us. I have now almost been on the staff at Renolda for 13 years. It'll be 13 years this June, and for a lot of that time, I spent uh, my Sundays working in student ministries, teaching kids, teaching youth, helping them learn about Jesus, and then preaching when Pastor Allen was away. And one of my favorite things to do over the course of those 13 years has been to write down the prayers of kids that I found remarkably funny. Because kids are funny in their bluntness and in their lack of political correctness and in their ability to ask just the right question in just the right season. So I thought this morning we might start as we continue our series called The Five Great Prayers from the Bible on some great prayers from some kids over the years. Dear God, did you mean for the giraffe to look like that? Or was it an accident? Dear God, please put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There is nothing good in there now. Dear God, I want to be just like my dad when I get old. Except without all the hair on my back. Dear God, please change the way that asparagus tastes. It tastes like grass. Dear God, I want you to know that I don't think anybody could be a better God than you. And I'm not just saying that because you're God. Or finally, dear God, my mom says that all babies cry. I don't think that baby Jesus cried. You know the answer, so write me back. We have a bet. Are you ready for some good news? Although the Lord's Prayer is said by Jesus, it actually reveals a beautiful truth about Jesus himself. This morning, we turn our attention to probably Jesus' most famous and most certainly his most lengthy sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. In here, we find that Jesus is talking about something that we like to call higher righteousness. It follows a pretty standard motif of, you've heard it said, referring to something in the Old Testament. And now he's broadening the scope of that. Not saying that our relationship with God is any more developed because of our obedience, but by saying that because of the work that he's about to do, Our affection for him will continue to grow. And the fruit of our affection for him will be so great that the world will be able to mark those followers of Jesus by their affection, the outworking of that affection in the people of God. Matthew's gospel, we've talked about this before, gives a very specific portrait of who Jesus is. Remember, all of these gospel writers are giving a particular portrait of Jesus Mark, for instance, might give Jesus as a servant, where Matthew is very, very focused on presenting Jesus as the Jewish king. Or more specifically in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 6, and 7, Jesus is a rabbi, a teacher. And as Jesus continues to teach in chapter 6, he's going to lay out some of his reflections own Jewish piety, or you might say Jewish worship life. And he looks at some of the spiritual disciplines that people who are followers of Jesus will have. He begins by talking about the giving of alms or the providing for those who are poor. And then he talks about prayer. And then he moves on in the end to fasting. And in chapter 6, he lays out just how these things should be done, primarily by saying that you have seen these things done in public in the middle of the synagogue or on the corners of streets. And I'm telling you to do those things in private and the Lord will reward you. What he's saying is, is that these spiritual practices are of God, but they're between you and God. And when you seek the reward of the public by doing these things publicly, you reap your reward in that moment. But to find a place, he even references maybe an inner room, 
a private room in your home where you can do these things, in particular prayer. Jesus in no way is devaluing the role of prayer in public worship or prayer in your community groups or prayer among friends. But he's saying that there is a special connection that happens between the believer and their father in private. And here Jesus begins to lay out in verse 5 of chapter 6, For they love to stand and pray in the synagogue in the street to draw attention to themselves. What we learn throughout Scripture is that the purpose of prayer is very clear. It is an opportunity for God to glorify himself through his sovereignty over all things. Excuse me. In prayer, we find an opportunity for God to glorify himself over all things. Remember, prayer isn't ultimately about convincing God to be for his children. All that needed to happen to merit God's affection for his children happened at the cross. So in prayer, we're not compelling God to be for us. More frequently, what we're doing in prayer is aligning our desires with that which God already has for us. We're moving our heart towards God, not moving God's heart towards us. And so in prayer, we as believers are acknowledging that God is sovereign, in control of all things. And we are asking God through our prayers and reflecting in our prayers, our desire that God display his glory, his purposes, his will, his goodness, his power over all things. And so... What this points us to is a big truth that I'm becoming more and more aware of. Is that in the Christian life, there aren't any spiritual victories apart from prayer. In the Christian life, there aren't any spiritual victories apart from prayer. And we learn, and we're learning together in this series, that our prayer life must be rooted in God's Word. Meaning, we read, we pray. We read, we pray. We read God's words, we pray God's words back to Him. We read God's words, we pray our desires to Him. In my own life, if I try to pray apart from God's Word, what I end up finding is that I can't last more than two minutes. But when I lose myself in God's Word, and I'm praying out of the abundance of what God's saying to me in His Word, I can pray with power and with confidence and with security. And what we do here is we begin to look at the ways that these prayers that God has given us in His Scriptures shape the very way we think about Him and the way we speak to Him. And today we turn our attention to the Lord's Prayer. Probably the most famous of all the prayers. The prayer that even those who don't believe in God or believe in the work of Jesus probably know. This prayer comes in the middle of the section I was talking about in Matthew chapter 6. And it really has two sections of three items each. The first section consisting of three items are all about God. And then the next Three items in the second section are all about us. And so as we read this together, Matthew 6, chapter uh, chapter 6, verse 9, see if you notice these divisions. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord's prayer prayer reflects something about our own lives. Our lives are full of big moments and small moments. Things that change the course of our story and small things that feel mundane or like maintenance that fill up our days. For instance, when a baby is born, that becomes the monumental big moment of our life. 
but that big moment of our life changes our life and fills it with mundane small things. With the arrival, the big arrival of the baby comes the daily, maybe even hourly changing of diapers. The moving into a new home, big, monumental, course-setting, course-correcting event in your life also brings with it small, mundane tasks that fill up your days like the mowing of the grass. This Lord's Prayer is full of both big ideas and small ideas. And the goal of the Lord's Prayer is that the small items turn our attention back to the big truths. Meaning, our need for food and forgiveness and safety continually return our attention to one who gives those things to us. So today, let's spend a few moments looking at this prayer of Jesus from Matthew 6 in reverse. By first looking at the second three items. Give us this day our daily bread. Martin Luther says famously, daily bread is everything necessary for the preservation of this life. Like food, bodily health, good weather, house, home, wife, children, good government, and peace. Our daily bread here is the mark of all of the substance that we have for our life and need for our well-being. Suggesting that God cares about the substance of our life. He cares about our needs. There's no need you have too small for God to care about. And so here you see that, Lord, give us our daily bread, not only talks about the substance, the broad scope of the things that every Christian needs, but it also talks about the frequency with which God cares and we can request. God, give us our daily bread. God, give us our daily needs. Give us our daily substance. Give us the daily peace in our home. Give us the daily words to bless our children and our spouse. Give us the daily grace to go into our job and to love others like Jesus loves us. Give us the financial and the provision that we need for our own life. Give us our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I think that forgiveness is the hardest part of Christianity. To be quick to forgive, whether it's a parent or child or friend who've sinned against you, or that very nice woman with Marilyn tags who on my way to church today pulled out in front of me, and as I wanted to tailgate after her take down her driver's license or her license plate number and put it on Facebook as a reminder of how poor her driving was. And the Lord said, you can't get in that pulpit and preach about forgiveness and not forgive this woman for nearly causing you to wreck. Right? So this is the hard part of being a Christian sometimes is, is that it's not only the forgiveness of people who've sinned greatly against us, but it's also the small things in life that mark that we have first been forgiven by God in Christ and now we forgive those who do even the mundane things against us. Be quick to forgive. This weekend we celebrate Mother's Day. And for many, many of our sisters in Christ, Mother's Day is not a day they celebrate. It's impending dread of the second weekend of May. 
that marks for them not the glory of motherhood that they had expected. For many of us, Mother's Day is the moment where we celebrate the woman who gave us children or the woman who gave us life, and we do that with glory and honor and an opportunity to really celebrate. But let's also be mindful that on this weekend there are many of our sisters who this is a reminder of only pain. Maybe it's the pain of a mother who did not love you well. Who spoke to you with harsh words. Who treated you physically in a way that was not God honoring. Who did not love you well into your gifts. But spoke and cursed you in ways that told you you did not have value. That you were to be seen and not heard. Or a mother who abandoned you. And left you in time of need. Or maybe for you, Mother's Day is a reminder that not only do your children not honor you with their words and their actions and put you in the place and position worthy a mother, but your husband does not treat you or love you in the way that God would have husbands love their wives to lay themselves down as Christ laid himself down for the church. Or maybe Mother's Day is even more painful. Maybe Mother's Day is a reminder to you that you are never able to become a mother. That as much as you tried and as much as you pled with the Lord and as much as modern science tried to make it happen for you, it just never did. And so for you, Mother's Day is not a celebration, but it's a reminder of the way that life has failed you. Hear me say, God's grace is sufficient for you. God's grace is sufficient for you to forgive your mother. God's grace is sufficient for you to forgive your child, to forgive your husband. And if you're one of those mothers, and if you're one of those children, or if you're one of those husbands who sinned against these mothers on Mother's Day, let today be the day that you forgive yourself for your sin, and you ask for forgiveness. For the ways that you have not loved like Jesus did. And if you were never able to become a mother. Know that Jesus. Wants to balm your soul. And bring healing to that place. Forgiveness is important in the Lord's prayer. Because it reminds us that we forgive. Not because it's easy. But because it's unbelievably difficult. It's unbelievably hard to just move forward. But what happens is, is as we remark at how God has forgiven us in Christ, it gives us the grace, the power, the strength, the courage to forgive where no one else would forgive. Where others would curse and reject In return, spirit for like spirit. Jesus says, I've made you for more than that. And of course it's hard to forgive. But I tell you, you can. Because you were first forgiven. Give us this day our daily substance. And forgive us as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. I've always found this text a little strange. After all, James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt with evil, 
And he himself tempts no one. God does not tempt us. So what could it possibly mean when we ask God not to lead us into temptation? This is where the nuance of language sometimes causes Scripture to lose its actual meaning. Because God does not tempt us. God does not lead us into temptation. Instead, this part of the Lord's Prayer is a reflection of our own heart's desire to flee the things that lead us away from God's best. God, because you do not tempt us, Continue to lead us away from temptation. Because, God, you do not tempt us. Continue to lead us away from temptation. And deliver us from evil. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. God, give us our daily bread. Give us our daily substance. Forgive us when... We cannot forgive ourselves and give us the power to forgive those who sinned against us. And Lord, because you are a good God and you love us, lead us not. Lead us away from temptation and deliver us from evil. Help us to flee the devil and he will flee us. And what happens when you do those three things, when you look at the small things of daily substance and daily forgiveness and daily temptation... It, by its very nature, returns our attention to the big three. Our need for food and forgiveness and freedom from temptation point us to the beginning of this prayer that says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father in heaven is a very, very interesting phrase. Our Father, the tenderness that we read in Matthew 6, 32, Your heavenly Father knows your need. He knows all of your needs. This is a tender Abba Father who welcomes you into his lap. But do not forget that this gentle, loving Father is also in heaven. Where Matthew 5, 34 and 35 says, But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. So at one level, God is our father who is affectionate, but be reminded that this father sits on the throne of heaven. Both merciful, but full of justice. And this is what we need from a father, a father who welcomes us into his arms But the authority of his name alone commands that all things under heaven and earth submit to him. My maternal grandmother who has passed away used to say when we would pray that she didn't want to pray her burdens to the Lord because God was too busy to hear her. And surely he had more important things to do. And even in her final moments, we were unable to convince her that God wanted to hear her prayers. And I remember thinking in the midst of that with her that this was not humble, but was a unique kind of arrogance. It wasn't humility. God isn't busy. God can't be busy. God can wield all of the things of the universe at the same moment for the benefit of your good and his glory at all times and all places. God isn't busy. If you really believe that your father is both tender and merciful, but also strong and just. If you really believe that God is strong, then you should be willing and excited to load his shoulders down with your burdens. Your kingdom come. Jesus turns his face to Pilate during the illegal trial to put him to death. And he says to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. We pray as Christians, as people who know how the story ends, as people who understand that the victory has already been secured, we pray that God's unseen kingdom will invade the seen kingdom. We spend our life glorifying God and looking 
for the ways that God invades our normal mundane lives with supernatural moments. We read Scripture with the expectancy that it is filled with supernatural occurrence. It is not a history book. It is not a science book. Although when it speaks to those things, it speaks to truth. But it is a supernatural book that tells one story about one man who interrupted human history to save sinners through a supernatural act of God. So we pray, God, let your kingdom, your unseen supernatural realm, invade human history every day. And may we take note of the things that only God can be glorified for and glorify God for those things. And let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are praying that God's will will become our will. That through the Spirit that lives in us, that raised Jesus from the dead, the Spirit that invades us at our conversion, when we say, yes, Jesus, I believe, the Spirit that comes in us, that that Spirit every day will shape, sanctify, mold our very will into the will of God our Father. But it also suggests that God's will is not always done. So in praying, your will be done, Lord, we're praying that His will will prevail over all the earth. That His story will affect and infect all things at all times, in all places. That the victory of His goodness and His sovereignty and His plan will win in every household, in every bedroom, in every neighborhood, in every schoolhouse, on every soccer field, in every business meeting. That God's will will prevail over the will of the enemy that seeks to destroy. See, powerful prayer isn't built on your ability to articulate fine theology or precise and selfless needs. Powerful prayer is about praying God's Word back to Him. We return this prayer of Jesus, the Lord's Prayer. We return this Lord's Prayer from Jesus back to Jesus. I love Paul's prayer in Philippians 1.9 that says, Lord, that your love may abound more and more. I pray it for myself every day. Lord, may your love abound in me more and more and more for my children, for my wife, for my church, for my friends. I pray for my children every day. Ephesians 1.16, praying God's word back to him. Lord, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, may their eyes be enlightened that they may know the hope to which they have been called, which are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. When we're praying for people who are struggling, we don't try to find the right words or the right way to articulate some deep theological truths. No, we pray Ephesians 3.14, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened and power through His Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. How do we pray for people seeking wisdom? We go to Colossians 1.9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as to walk in the manner worthy of the Lord. How do we pray for those who just want to see God's truth worked out in their life we go to luke 1 and say behold i am the servant of the lord let it be according to your word how do we pray for the lost there aren't fancy prayers for that there's not a book for that other than the bible and the bible says pray john 17 jesus says, great high priestly prayer glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life To all whom you have given him. I don't know how to pray. 
not some secret book they give you at the end of seminary and says, congratulations, you know right now know how to pray. But I know what God says about himself and about me, and I'm going to pray those things and stand on those promises. This week I found two things remarkable about the Lord's Prayer that I don't think I'd ever seen. The first one was, what does it mean to hallow your name? This prayer, after all, begins with, hallowed be your name. Hallowing means to reverence or to sanctify, meaning sanctify the name of God. So it might be appropriate to study the Lord's Prayer to start with a prelude of looking at God's names. Something interesting here about hallowing your name. I spent my whole life, I think, believing my grandpa, who passed away recently at 93, always prayed in the King James English. It's just the way that he prayed. It's the way he learned how to pray. And so I grew up believing that hallowed be your name was just a way for us to say, Praise be to God. So praise be to God and you move on through the Lord's Prayer. But in fact, hallowed be your name is in the third person singular imperative. Now, that means nothing even to me. I found that out this week. But it, what it means is, is that Jesus who's praying this is making a petition, not on his behalf, but he's asking God to do something. He's saying, God, hallowed be your name. Sanctify your name. Make your name known it's a petition to god for god to make himself known and what is he making known his names to moses he says i am in exodus 33 he says i will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name the lord when he appears to isaiah he calls himself god almighty in exodus 34 he says the lord passes before him and proclaim the lord the lord a god merciful and glorious isaiah 6 1 he said i saw the lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up revelation says that god is both the alpha and the omega hallowed be your name lord make your name known lord let them know that i am the lord god almighty merciful and glorious high and lifted up omega alpha and omega rules over all the earth so although it may be true that this lord's prayer is three and three it might be more accurate to say that it's one and five that the last five statements actually point to the first statement meaning lord let the purpose of renolda church be so that god's name can be hallowed god's name can be known jesus's name can be made famous let it be, God, that your name is hallowed. Let the kingdom come so that Jesus' name can be hallowed. Let your will be done so that your name may be known. Let our daily bread be given so that the Lord's name may be known. Let our forgiveness come and the forgiveness of others be extended so that Jesus' name may be made known. Lead us towards holiness so that Jesus' name may be made famous. God, hallow your name. Make your name great. God, do what only you can do to make your name great in Kernersville so that people can see the glory of the gospel. Lord, do what only you can do to make your name great so the people of Clemens, North Carolina can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, their King. Lord, do what only you can do to make your name famous in the city of Winston-Salem so that people can come to know the hope and healing that comes through the Spirit of the risen Jesus. Lord, Make your name known through radio and through internet and through other digital means. 
Lord, never make the name of Renolda Church famous. Never make the name of Chris Lawson famous. Never make the name of Alan Wright famous. Lord, through us, make your name famous. God working through us for one purpose. Hallowed be your name. I also notice this week that Jesus says, Forgive us our debts as we, has all, as we have also forgiven our debtors. When Jesus says that, he knows a secret that the people who are sitting listening to the Sermon on the Mount don't know. I, I mean, there are times, and I think this is one of them, when Jesus says stuff to them and he has a smirk on his face like a good parent who knows how it's going to end up, but hadn't yet let them in on that secret. So Jesus says to them, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And he smirks because he knows just a while later, he's going to say this. For this is my blood of a new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins does not make its way straight from the fatherhood of God to us, but rather from the fatherhood of God through the death of his son applied to a people who did not earn it. Jesus even gets the glory for his own prayer. Jesus not only speaks it, but he establishes the truth of the Lord's Prayer and holds up the Lord's Prayer through his own work. There wouldn't be a Lord's Prayer without Jesus. Liberalism tries to argue that the Lord's Prayer shows us what Christianity is. It's fatherhood of God, it's brotherhood of man, and it's love your neighbor. That that's really what Christianity is. And I say, no, 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 no. That's why Jesus smirked. Christianity is the cross that brings forgiveness of sin. We aren't in the Lord's Prayer pleading for forgiveness. We're claiming forgiveness that's already been bought. Prayer and praying the Lord's Prayer for your own life is about hallowing the name of Jesus. We tell the story of Jesus over and over and over again. We say, God, make your name famous. And then we tell our story over and over and over again in ways that make the name of Jesus famous. Over and over and over again, we account for the story that's only our story. But we retell that story in a way that brings glory and honor to a king who sat at the right hand of the Father and gave up that place willingly to be born of a virgin, to live the life that we can never live, to die the death that we rightfully should have died because of our rejection of Him. And on the third day, He was raised as King of kings and Lord of lords and returns to the right hand of the Father where He waits and intercedes and blesses and advocates on behalf of those who believe in His work. And we hallow His name. We glorify His name. We make the name of Jesus famous every day in every way by telling the story of how God saved sinners like us. And then God fills us up with His Spirit and He sends us out into His world to tell the story of how He saved sinners like us. And we make the name of Jesus famous by telling that story. And we go out into our neighborhoods, into our streets, into our cul-de-sacs, into the dance studios, onto the soccer fields, and we hallow the name of Jesus. We make His name famous. 
and his name famous alone. And that's the gospel.